I have the privilege to um, to introduce our speaker today for uh, our CME for the Hospital Sedang. I know that many of you are not uh, from Hospital Sedang, but um, just welcome to this uh, very hot topic for uh, 2021, will be the OP in uh, with uh, COVID-19. All right, for the, before further ado, let me just introduce our speaker today, uh, which is uh, Dr. Nuru Afiza. So she's none other than our in-house uh, pulmonologist in uh, Hospital Sedang. So Dr. Nuru obtained her master's in um, internal medicine from UKM in 2011, and subsequently uh, she completed her subspecialty training in respiratory medicine and uh, served uh, in uh, multiple institutions in Malaysia. And she also underwent another uh, fellowship training in uh, interstitial lung disease under Professor uh, Poletti in Italy. So after that, she came back to uh, Sedang Hospital. And then now here we are. We're going to listen to the expert to talk on this uh, organizing pneumonia in COVID-19. Without further ado, um, Dr. Nuru, the floor is yours. Um, hi, thank you, Dr. Lee, for the very kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining our hospital CME today. Um, okay, let me... How am I going to... Okay. All right. Okay, so it is our turn, uh, Pharmacology Department, to present uh, uh, for this week for our hospital CME. Before um, I start uh, my talk, oops, sorry. Okay, before I start uh, my talk, I would like everyone to know that uh, this month, September, is the Pulmonary Fibrosis Awareness Month. The aim is to uh, spread awareness about pulmonary fibrosis, not only uh, to the public, but also among the uh, healthcare workers and about the impact of this devastating disease. So please show your support by joining us and please log in into the any social media account and help us to spread the message far by liking, sharing, retweeting, and commenting on the fact that is posted every day for 30 days for a month of, uh, of uh, September. So some of, okay. So uh, you are not uh, really aware of uh, what is pulmonary fibrosis. It is not just um, one disease, it is a family of over more than 200 entities that is under the umbrella of interstitial lung disease. Okay, so now let's move on to um, our talk today, organizing pneumonia in uh, patients with COVID-19. So these are the outline of uh, our talk for today. What is organizing pneumonia? And what, what do we know about organizing pneumonia in COVID-19 patients? And how does um, the OP patterns look like on the imaging? And what's the treatment? How to manage the... Can you do one minute? Uh, can we shoot the... How to manage the... Um, uh, COVID... Uh, how to manage OP? and also uh, how to follow it up and what are the post-COVID uh, circulate. And actually, this uh, CME has been arranged in a way to aid our doctors in our Serdang uh, COVID pool uh, wards to select the patients, uh, correct patients uh, for a respiratory consult as we receive up to six, uh, 60 referrals a day, which is quite a lot uh, from the COVID wards. So the second part will be presented by Dr. Ko Zeshang, our respiratory fellow. And he will speak on the outcome of our post-COVID OP patients, which is under our respiratory clinic follow-up. Okay, so um, I believe 
by this uh, everyone is familiar by now what is uh, OP? You have been heard OP since the pandemic started uh, about a year ago. So what is OP is all about? So there is one study looking at the autopsy specimen in 21 patients. So uh, histologically, it mainly shows exudative phase of diffuse alveolar damage with a minority displaying the organizing or proliferative phase. So clinically, these patients uh, have ARDS or acute lung injury. On imaging, you could appreciate uh, diffuse lung infiltration, ground glass opacity, consolidation on both lungs. And on histology, it could represent the DAD and also some organizing pneumonia pattern. Um, so in our context, from the respiratory point of view, when we talk about the organizing pneumonia, it is not a clinical diagnosis. OP is a pattern described or observed on the imaging or histology. However, um, organizing pneumonia can be adapted into a clinical uh, diagnosis depending on the cause of it. So when we talk about the interstitial ILD, as my interest is in ILD. So we have organizing pneumonia listed under the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. We call it as um, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which is of unknown cause. And why I want to highlight this? Because some of us may get confused with the cryptogenic <laughs> organizing pneumonia and organizing pneumonia. Okay, so now, um, organizing pneumonia is a response to lung injury. Any insult cause the uh, inflammation at the lungs, uh, uh, lung parenchyma. And it is, it is a process of pulmonary uh, lung, uh, it's a process of lung tissue repair that can be either um, idiopathic or unknown cause, or secondary to a lung injury itself, or histologically, it can be associated with another lung pathology. For example, uh, you have a metastinal mass and uh, you took a biopsy. And the pathologist uh, is coming, uh, the HPE result reported as a lymphoma. So, but pathologists if, may report as a OP, uh, pattern as one of the findings uh, from the biopsy on the HPE. So basically, if you treat the lymphoma, the OP will resolve or disappear. All right. So what about the secondary OP? There are many causes of the secondary OP. Uh, for example, due to drug toxicity, what you need to do is stop the drugs and observe. And collagen uh, tissue disease, you have to treat the underlying cause and in radiotherapy also, uh, the OP can grow away from the target site and after the end of the radiotherapy treatment. And the, but the main thing is it is caused by the uh, infection, be it bacteria, viruses, or fungal. So in our context today is a COVID-19 virus itself. And okay, this figure showed us the clinical phase in COVID-19, which is, I think most of us is familiar with this uh, timeline, the severity of the illness. It illustrates three escalating phases of COVID-19 disease progression, uh, starting from stage one, early infection, stage two, pulmonary phase, stage, stage three, hyperinflammation phase. Uh, there are two distinct but overlapping pathologic sets. The first triggered by the virus itself, and the second by the host uh, response. So the disease tends to present and follow these two phases, i.e. the viral response phase and the host inflammatory response phase. However, the level of uh, severity is different for each patient, um, depending on whether he or she is in immunocompetent state or immunocompetent state, um, as in elderly 
or immunocompromised uh, host. And in the early infection, stage one, uh, similar to SARS-CoV, which responsible for 2002-2003 SARS outbreak, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the COVID-19, binds to ACE2 receptor, which abundantly uh, present, especially on alveolar epithelium, intestine epithelium, and vascular endothelium. In patients who can keep the virus contained, limited at this uh, stage of COVID-19, the prognosis and recovery are excellent. In the second stage of pulmonary phase, the phase where viral multiplication uh, and localized inflammation in the lung happen, patients will experience uh, shortness of breath, develop hypoxemia, and you can appreciate the lung infiltration on the chest S3. And a min minority of COVID-19 patients will transition into the third uh, stage, uh, which is the most severe stage of the illness, in which uh, they manifest as the systemic hyperinflammation due to cytokine storm uh, release of the older inflammatory cytokines. And in this stage, um, you can have a pulmonary, both pulmonary and extra pulmonary uh, involvement manifestation. The RDS can happen, shock, uh, cardiac failure with other multi-organ failure may occur. After all, the prognosis and recovery from this critical stage are poor. Okay, and um, the time duration is uh, counted from the onset of the symptoms and the pathological process does not always evolve through all the stages. Uh, but may cease or recover at any phase based on the um, virulence and also the host uh, status. So this, one to, this is to illustrate the histological features and patterns that may vary and coexist depending, uh, dependent upon the time point in disease evolution, severity of disease and the pathways induced by viral uh, infection. And it is also applied to imaging pattern. But imaging finding the patient's image is at the time of scanning when you request and underlying disease, uh, diseases and drugs intervention, what we give uh, to the patients in the world. And it's, uh, if you see the CT scan, uh, the typical features are the density, which is a ground glass, op you can have a ground glass opacity, consolidation, uh, interlobular septal thickening, and the distribution and uh, and the distribution, which is mid and lower uh, lungs, the locations, whether it is peripheral and subplural or, uh, or central. So these uh, features is actually depend when you perform the CT scan, at what stage of the disease, at what stage of the clinical presentations uh, that patients were. So... For example, in early disease, you can have a peripheral distribution, uh, and, but the most uh, frequency uh, pattern that you see was uh, ground glass opacity uh, with bilateral distribution. In the severe disease, the majority or the most, uh, or the mainly pattern was the consolidation without with or without the ground glass opacity. And later stage in the recovery reabsorption phase, there were a strip like opacity. Um, these are the various patterns of lung uh, changes um, that occurs at various time point from the symptom onset in the early disease. Majority was the, the mainly um, pattern was ground glass opacity. And when the disease uh, progress, 
you can have a mixed pattern, which is the ground glass opacity, consolidation, and the reticula. And okay, um, these uh, four phases of imaging findings, it was described in this study. Um, the four phases were early phase, the progressive phase, um, the severe phase, as well as dissipative phase. So I will go just briefly. So basically in the early phase, you can see either single or multiple, it was a lesion, it was distributed along the subpleural and bronchi. So the finding indicates that the spread along uh, the disease spread along the airway, starting from the bronchioles, and then um, goes to the alveolar uh, epithelium, and they extending gradually from the peripheral to the central. That's why from the for the early disease, you can appreciate the lesion is at the peripheral. So in the progressive phase, which is the most uh, COVID uh, lesion, progress rapidly. And if you perform the scan uh, during the uh, severe clinical class, uh, inf um, uh, 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 manifestation in which patient is in a hyperinflammatory state, you can see the number of lesions increase significantly with increase the extent and also in the density. They will have, you can appreciate the coexist of the ground glass opacity. I'm sorry, I, ha I had to mute uh, everybody. Dr. Norul, please go ahead. Continue. I'm sorry for the interruption. Go ahead, Dr. Norul. Because there was some noise. Okay. All right. Okay, Dr. Jamalur. I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah. So, where was it just now? Okay, in the progressive phase, um, which is, um, uh, if you see clinically, it tallies with the hyperinflammation uh, phase. So you can see a mixture of ground glass opacity and consolidations indicates that uh, newly formed lesion as well as the original lesions with partial reabsorption. And you, uh, there are some crazy paving appearance as well due to the thickening of the inter, uh, interlobular and intralobular sector that reflecting the interstitial uh, lesions. Okay, so um, in severe phases as well, you can see a white lung due to the diffuse infiltration of all segments of the uh, lung. So this is mainly because of the exudative phase, uh, exudative phase attacking um, the uh, alveoli epithelium, attacking the type 2 monocytes. If you want to correlate uh, histologically, it's attacking your type 2 pneumocytes, which are responsible for the uh, production of the surfactant. So less surfactant causing the lung collapse, the uh, alveoli collapse, and you lost lung loss their compliance. Okay, in the dissipative uh, stage, uh, which which uh, occurs, uh, usually you see these features after 14 days, it shows a gradual absorption, meaning um, it is in the recovery, the lung try to healing, repair response, yeah? So this is towards the organizing pneumonia, which is, this is, um, that's why um, some patients, you don't, uh, the OP, these changes can resolve spontaneously, eventually. So you don't need to give a, a longer or high dose steroids even for this type of patients. Um, so in a few cases, the causes of this uh, disease was shorter. It may progress directly from the early phase to the uh, dissipative uh, stage, which is in the mild uh, disease. Okay, oh, there were, there's lots of background noise here. Okay, um, so now I want to highlight the treatment of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia first, not uh, organizing pneumonia in COVID-19 uh, uh, patients. So in COP, um, why I listen and echo? Okay, so much better now. 
So in COP, um, it's respond. Um, uh, it has an excellent response with corticosteroid uh, treatment. And it has a very a rapid, you can see a rapid improvement, uh, both clinically and on imaging. Uh, from the uh, ILD uh, point of view in COP, we, it's require a higher dose up to 1.5 milligram, but I usually give up to one milligram uh, fearing the toxi toxicity of the steroids. And in refractory cases, you can give rituximab and cyclophosphamide. And the difference is here, the treatment. In COP, we, give, we start at the higher dose with a longer duration of steroids. So what about in OP, in um, uh, COVID-19? So this is a, a well-known uh, timeline uh, graph, uh, basically, the pharmacotherapy targeted against the virus, um, the antivirus, if you start uh, early, it holds the greatest uh, promise in the COVID-19 patients. But the usefulness in advanced stages is doubtful. Similarly, the use of anti-inflammatory, such as um, in the case of uh, steroids, applied too early may not be necessary and it All could right, even right. uh, provoke the viral replications. Oh, yeah. So here, um, our NIH and IDSA has made a recommendation on using DEXA uh, based on WHO meta-analysis on the seventh uh, randomized uh, trial. Why is it? And the randomized trial, including the recovery trials, uh, DEXA improve um, mortality outcome in patients requiring oxygen support, mechanical ventilations, and ECMO. And there were no potential benefit or harm in patients who do not require the oxygen support. I am not going to talk on the treatment of hyperinflammation in COVID-19. Um, we have for a Serdang uh, doctors, especially in COVID pool, we have a slide prepared nicely, beautifully done Hello. by our ID team, uh, Dr. Lim Kachuan and Dr. Shah. So you may refer to this um, uh, 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 slide. So, but this is the latest updated version for um, KKM um, management in the COVID-19. Um, recent randomized trials suggest either baricitinib, uh, the jet. Uh, inhibitor or tocilizumab IL-6 uh, inhibitor as an adjunct to dexamethasone in the selected patients uh, with a severe uh, illness, COVID illness, as it has a survival benefit, reduced 28 days uh, mortality. We also have post-COVID uh, management protocol by MOH. Um, once, if you give a, uh, a prednisolone for OP uh, pattern on CT scan in COVID-19. However, just uh, make sure uh, the, the, the give it uh, correctly with cautions. So, okay, I want to highlight, uh, this is the guidance, a guide from prepared uh, from our department um, for the usage in hospital Serdang. Uh, so once you confirm uh, OP pattern on the CT scan, what you should do is you should see the percentage of involvement, involvement on the CT, whether uh, it's mild, less than 50%, or moderate, 50 to 75%, or severe involvement, uh, 75 to 100%. In mild uh, involvement, you can um, give that sametasone a continuation from the hyperinflammation that that's how you give for the hyperinflammation COVID and you can complete up to 14 days depending on the patients and be given follow up at the primary healthcare. And in moderate uh, OP, you can give that sametasone up to 14 days or oral prednisolone up to 0 0.5 milligram, uh, taper 5 milligram every three to five days and off. Uh, in severe OP with uh, early fibrosis, you can give up to one milligram, be cautioned here, I will explain further and taper five 
milligram every three to five days and off, but the maximum is at 60 milligram. So the patients will be given a follow-up at our respiratory post-COVID OP clinic. So I want to advocate here that we should start a lower dose of steroid with a shorter duration, fast tapering. Uh, once the patient is out of the acute phase of hyperinflammation, or now patients is, is in recovery phase. So there are a few factors to consider. You have to look at the cumulative steroid dose, um, including the methylprednisolone received or uh, dexamethasone uh, while patients in ICU or in HDU or in wards. Okay, so then you can decide whether you want to taper, you, they need a tapering dose, or you can just continue and just stop at the treatment. And this is the most important thing, the oxygen requirement in wards. If you see a patient, they just need a short duration of oxygen support, oxygen supplementation. Uh, and when you review them, they're already comfortable under room air. So perhaps they don't need a steroid. You don't need to uh, give a, a prednisolone following the dexamethasone. So you can just uh, continue with the dexamethasone uh, for a, based on the NX2E uh, protocol, whether um, uh, up to 10 or 14 days or, or, or upon the discharge, whichever can uh, come first. So as this patient, they can, um, the OP can resolve uh, uh, by themselves. You don't need to give an anti-inflammatory basically to the control, the severity of the hyperinflammation in these patients. And also, the progression of the serial chest x-ray in the ward. Please review the serial chest x-ray of the patients in the ward. Look at, at the latest chest x-ray prior to the discharge. If they, they show a marked improvement as compared to the chest x-ray at the time of, of the CT scan. So perhaps you want to just give a low dose of the steroid or the patient and a, a low dose of the steroids. And please assess the risk of uh, prolonged steroid in the patients, diabetic, elderly patients, risk of getting infection or organ failure. And please uh, look at the evidence of the active infection. For example, look at the blood culture in the ward. If glue bacteria infection, uh, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, or patients have active TB, so please don't start steroids. So perhaps, after all, the OP is secondary to the COVID plus the secondary infection as well. So what you need to do is to treat the underlying cause. So now, besides the uh, drugs, um, we advocate, in Serdang, we advocate an early intervention of pulmonary rehab. We are fortunate to have a very good support from our uh, pulmonary rehab uh, department. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saari. And um, this kit is actually uh, prepared by our unit physiotherapy. Uh, it was provided to our COVID inpatients. And what we do is the deep breathing exercise, lip uh, first breathing. We advocate patients to have self uh, prone and do uh, intensive pulmonary, um, intensive uh, spirometry uh, to, to improve the oxygenation. It's also no, this to prevent is the deconditioning and also a myopathy. Uh, myopathy uh, due to the side effects of the steroids. So in, uh, the, as from the study shows that pulmonary rehabilitation is effective, feasible and safe, regardless the uh, independence to the uh, disease uh, severity, be it in mild COVID or a severe uh, stage of COVID. So what about the... Yeah. There's some noise in the background there. Uh, dear all attendees, uh, could you please mute yourself so that we can focus on, on the talk and uh, we will surely have a Q&A at the end uh, of, of the two talks. Thank you very much. Uh, your cooperation is very much appreciated. Please go on, Dr. Nurul. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jamalul. So, um, okay, um, what about antifibrotic? So, well, um, uh, is there any uh, role in the antiviral uh, mechanism? 
where there are a few trials looking at the role of antifibrotic in SARS-CoV-2 uh, induced pulmonary fibrosis. However, these trials are still un, uh, at the recruitment uh, phase. And can we predict uh, who can uh, progress eventually to develop a pulmonary fibrosis post-COVID? So some of the risk factor is similar with, uh, with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a subset under the interstitial lung disease. Um, they were those with uh, advanced age, male uh, smokers, be it former smoker, active smoker, and they have comor comorbidities such as diabetic, hypertension, uh, heart, uh, heart problem, and uh, besides the um, increased uh, disease severity in COVID and the prolonged um, ICU stays. These ATS documents released or uh, published in 2018 um, stated that chronic viral infection is um, one of the risk factors associated with uh, IPF. Who knows, in perhaps 10 or 15, 20 years' time, um, post COVID um, 19 lung fibrosis uh, due to COVID 19 virus is, will be included as one of the entities under the interstitial lung disease. So these are the favorite answer questions uh, for a respiratory uh, consultations when to do a HRCT or a CTPA. So we advocate for uh, to proceed with CTPA mainly if the patients have persistent or new onset of uh, symptoms. Uh, if patients have persistent hypoxia or increasing supplemental oxygen, especially later in the disease. Uh, you, you, you are a bit suspicious. He's uh, in the recovery, but why he still has a persistent hypoxia? CRP is coming down. So, but why is it so? Or you have a worsening chest S3. So, in a CTPA, you can exclude a pul pulmonary embolism. Please, uh, the main thing is we want to uh, exclude the pulmonary embolism. As you know, OP is just a pattern on the uh, uh, CT scan. So on the imaging. So uh, if patients already have COVID-19 uh, pneumonia, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, I would say on the CT scan, of course, they will show some pattern of the OP. And also at the same time, you can see um, imaging features that may suggest a secondary, uh, secondary uh, infection or even a cardiac-related causes such as pulmonary hypertension, undiagnosed before, or heart failure. And again, MDT helps uh, to, de to determine the cause of uh, non-resolving uh, non uh, symptoms patients. So, okay, in OP, do we need to start steroid? If so, then how to uh, taper down uh, the steroids? These are the practical tips for OP in COVID-19. So first, you have to decide which phase uh, a patient's in, whether patient still actively ongoing hyper in hyperinflammation phase or already in the recovery phase, reabsorption phase. And if in the hyperinflammation phase uh, on high flow mass, on high flow nasal cannula, so please treat the hyperinflammation, um, uh, refer to the NX2E by KKM protocol. And step two, rule out other causes of secondary OP and treat accordingly. And determine the severity of OP. Is steroids really necessary? See the chest X-ray, and you can see the patients clinically, um, or whether you can wait and watch patients. In step four, please assess the risk of steroid toxicity in patients if you are about to start to give some steroid for the patients, and decide the dose of uh, pregnancy loan. Um, of late, we tend to give a lower dose. So usually we give um, 0.25 to 0.5 milligram and titrate. Uh, usually uh, what we give is about 20 or maximum 30 milligram uh, and titrate 5 milligram every three days. So, and to ensure the follow-up is arranged, but bear in mind the, the every treatment is different for each patient. So do you need to follow up? Yes, uh, this is a PTS guideline prepared by, by the PTS committee. This is for the category four and five. 
uh, ideally to follow up uh, to have a virtual consultation at six weeks, but six weeks uh, after discharge, but it is not feasible to be done in a certain hospital. So at 12 weeks, uh, do a face-to-face -face clinical assessment, um, do a chest x-ray, and uh, look at, you assess the patient, mainly the clinical symptoms. Um, if abnormalities, patient symptomatic, you can repeat a CT scan, and if evidence of interstitial lung disease can we make a referral to the RSP clinic. And this is the um, follow-up for a from the management protocol MOH um, at 12 weeks and with the chest x-ray. And if uh, abnormal or patient symptomatic, again, CT imaging and make a consult to a respiratory physician. So what about the post-acute COVID-19 and long COVID syndrome? What should we do? So basically nowadays we are, look, we are seeing increasing trend of patients coming, coming to uh, ED or referred from the clinic kesihatan or our own clinic warga. Uh, there are two types of patients, those who were admitted and got discharged home. And the second time, uh, the second type is the um, patients who did not uh, get admission, um, who were under home uh, quarantine. So acute COVID-19 usually lasts until four weeks from the onset of symptoms. And post-acute COVID-19 is defined as persistent uh, symptoms or delayed or long-term complications beyond uh, four weeks. So uh, some call it long COVID or post-COVID syndrome. It can affect all category from one to five, they are not infectious. They may experience more than one symptoms or even can develop a new symptoms with multiple organ involvement. So this is what you can see. Um, the long COVID uh, patients, they may present it to you with the ongoing or not improving symptoms since from the what? Since from the discharge, it could be due to viral infections or ongoing inflammations. And the new symptoms, uh, you have to rule out the complications of COVID. Uh, it could be due to ongoing um, uh, the, the pulmonary embolism or, or venous thromboembolism, the DVT. And you have to rule out the complication related to comorbidities, such as uh, the, the diabetic or the um, worsening heart uh, status, such as pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and complication related to the treatment side effects of the steroids. And also it could be the complications post intubation. Patient may, may come to you with stridor or localized wheezing. Please, you have to rule out the tracheostenosis. It could be the complications of uh, post intubations and non-specific effects of uh, hospitalization, psychological issues and deconditioning. Um, I will skip this. Uh, okay, so basically, these are the, um, oh, sorry. Okay, when the patient comes to you, the to educate activities that you can be done at home, ensure the compliance and adherence to follow up and medications and advocate uh, on healthy lifestyle, ask the patient to stop smoking, stop vaping, ask them to reduce weight as we see later. All our patients now, the trend is they are young with uh, morbid obese. Okay, and for those who have not uh, have a vaccination, uh, ask them to register uh, and get the vaccination following the COVID. And these are the uh, some photos, um, activities done by our uh, physiotherapy in our post-COVID OP clinic. So we run the clinic together with our um, rehab uh, department. Uh, the aim is to assess for the strengthening of the, um, uh, the strengthening and the uh, muscle endurance uh, for the exercise breathing as well as to look for the complications, myopathy from the uh, effect of the steroids. Okay, with that, I thank you. I want to take this opportunity, the acknowledgement to Dr. Ansha from UITM and Dr. Shakirin for